Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. So we will adjust the panel a little bit. This is the first time we're all meeting in person, I think. Yeah, yeah, first time. Correct, yeah, so correct. this is truly in the spirit of digital fashion. We've <laughs> been only interacting online, but there's so much to talk about when it comes to digital fashion and everything that uh, we've been working on, but also just what's happening in the industry. So um, I'd also like love to invite you guys to ask each other questions, because I'm sure I definitely have questions for both of you. But um, first, uh, Carrie, you've got, like, the fabricant has taken the biggest risk in terms of jumping into digital fashion at the time when people thought it was quite stupid, that that would, that would be a response you would hear. So how are you noticing that all of the efforts you've done with all of the releases and the drops that you just covered, what has changed and why is digital fashion having its moment right now? Great question. Um, I mean, digital fashion will keep having its moment simply because it's growing the whole time. Uh, as I said in my presentation, like it, for me it was mind blowing that in 2016 digital fashion was not a thing. Seeing that my own background is in film and visual effects, which already went through digital transformation in the in the early 90s, we've seen it with photography, we've seen it with architecture, automotive, and all the other design industries. So it was a no-brainer that it was going to, you know, happen at some point. Timing-wise, I think we were lucky in that sense that you know. Uh, people w warmed up for the idea. Even though the, the conversation always been like, oh, digital fashion's stupid. Uh, but then the next layer was like, oh, that's kind of cute. That's not gonna be anything. And then when the pandemic hit, people really started thinking about digital fashion actually being something where we're gonna be curating or narrating our, our own stories, our unique identities, seeing that our lives are becoming so extremely digital. And of course, gaming is, is a massive industry. And if, if you look at like where Fortnite, for example, is getting majority of its money, it's through skins, it's through digital clothing. Now the next step is actually enabling ownership for the digital clothing itself, because right now if you buy a Fortnite skin, um, yeah, you know, and Fortnite disappears, your digital clothing also disappears. Uh, so it, that's been kind of like the evolution of what, what's been going through with digital fashion. And it's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger. You know, I think it, for, it's probably one of the biggest opportunities for the metaverse. If you really think about all the different business models that are going to come through blockchain and NFTs, especially for the gaming market, digital fashion is going to become massive. Yeah, and I think even now, there's still the overlap between fashion and crypto is still developing. I think it's not an obvious solution to the fashion industry. I think crypto particularly doesn't really care about fashion, but they start to see that fashion is one of the biggest industries in the world, and we all have a relationship to fashion in, in, some, in some way. We make uh, two different choices every day. We wear fashion for its function, um, as a garment that, for example, if it's uh, cold outside, we're wearing a coat to be able to go outside. But then there's also an emotional and a very psychological, mental element of fashion, which is all about how you feel. It's about fun. And uh, Emma, I think you stepped into this industry not having come from fashion, so you have a very fresh perspective as you're looking at the infrastructure, how it's been running this whole time. So tell us more of your journey of actually choosing to get involved with the digital fashion and how your background helps you see it in a different way. Yeah, um, thank you. Good question. So um, my background isn't fashion. It's actually very much rooted in Web3. And um, I came into Web3 about five years ago, and I was really focused more on the financial aspect, so I came into DeFi. And then um, from there, it was like a progression of really understanding how the entire medium of where everything operates and exists today, every single industry, every economy, is radically changing, transforming. Um, it's a paradigm shift, and so many people can't see it. And this is really how paradigm shifts work. Um, we cannot see what is right in front of us, and then um, the transformational upheaval takes place, and then what happens is, is everyone can't remember what the previous worldview uh, held sacred. And that's what really what we're seeing today, because what is Web3, what is the blockchain in its most pure form? It is an uncensorable, self-sovereign, social coordination technology. And why is social coordination so critical to everything? is because as humans, we communicate and we coordinate. That's literally what distinguishes us from every other animal species. Um, it's what gives us our advantage. That's how we build cities, it's how we build societies, it's how we build global economies, nations. And um, if you see now, I mean, like just to kind of add on that too, Facebook, it's a social coordination technology. Airbnb, social coordination technology. Uber, literally everything. And so when you start to realize that um, 
the social coordination kind of medium that we've been relying on for the past seven decades or 70, 75 years since World War II um, is changing, then you start to see like, holy shit, this is a massive techno-cultural techno revolution that is bigger than um, the computing age, that is bigger than the production and transfer of energy, bigger than um, literally anything that we've seen before, like air travel, any of these massive kind of shifts and moments in history. And so um, I started to really see that and understand then what that means when we think about the metaverse moving forward and everyone in um, Web3, which really what Web3 is, it, it is this kind of in its full expression, the open decentralized metaverse. Everyone now can have this social coordination technology across governance, capital, um, and everything in between in their pocket, in their device, then that transforms um, just the way that we live today and fashion is the interface that is tangible. It's in meat space, it's in the digital realm. Everyone can understand it's how we render, it's how we, we self-express, um, how we communicate with each other. And so, um, yeah, it was really seeing that and then understanding um, how that kind of focal point is critical to building everything off of it. I love how you're describing the revolution that crypto and the blockchain ecosystem is able to foster. If I think about, um, how, if I were to describe it in terms of how it fits within our current framework, we use the human blockchain to validate each other. For example, we've been talking online for so for so long, but it's the moment when we meet, there's this like moment of, this is Carrie, this is me. You have this moment of validation, the social validation. And I think blockchain also enables us to finally redesign systems for harmony. Because if we think of fashion in itself, uh, or the fast fashion aspect of fashion, it is a brilliant business model in terms of how it's designed, but it is Lever it is. Um, it has to leverage being able to make somebody pay for its inefficiencies. So if you really particularly don't care about sustainability, I think looking at uh, this from a business perspective and seeing how redesigning fast fashion with blockchain systems in mind and creating an equitable relationship between creators and designers is in the benefit of the business as well. So when we talk about digital fashion, we often address how it can mitigate the effects that fast fashion currently has in our ecosystem. But despite all of the benefits that we discuss, I think there's still a lot of critics who say like, digital fashion is not really gonna take off. This may be uh, only for gaming ecosystems. This will be a very, very niche topic. So Carrie, what do you think in terms of adoption? Like, do you think people will will be wearing digital fashion within the next, say, five years? Or do you still think it will have to, it will still remain niche until there will be a generational shift? No, it's a very good question. And you know, we can only speculate about the future. Um, definitely will be more than it is right now. I, th I think that's, uh, that's easy to predict. Who's going to be wearing digital fashion? Um, that's the biggest question. It's going to be people who are really excited about the space, really excited about the idea of the metaverse, really excited about the idea of, of virtual identities. How do we want to create? How do we want to narrate our stories in our online world? Uh, because we're already doing it. You know, like your Instagram picture, your Twitter picture, your LinkedIn profile picture, this whole profile picture culture that's happening right now is, is a way to identify your identity. And fashion is going to play a role in that. You know, and there's, there's some, you know, fantastic players already in that. You know, some of you might know like Artifact and what they've done with Clone X. They're creating a whole ecosystem. You know, they got avatars, they got sneakers, they got clothing. They really just see themselves as a, as a brand, the, the, the future brand. And I think what's doing smart, it's, you know, taking an existing concept and putting it into a new context. Because that's what we need to do. We can't just replicate the fashion industry as it is right now and just be like, okay, it's just gonna be the exact same in the metaverse. Same thing for us. What is a digital fashion house? It doesn't mean that we only de design digital clothing. No, we're also a technology company. We need to design the technology that enables digital fashion to become mainstream, enables it to be accessible to everybody because that's, let's say, the big promise of the Web3 space is accessibility. Well, it's not accessible for everybody right now because you need a device you need a smartphone, you need Wi-Fi. Uh, we're already seeing here that you know, like we're having issues with Wi-Fi and if we're not connected to the world, we're not connected to digital fashion itself. So there's a lot of, uh, lot of challenges that goes into like, creating digital fashion mainstream. But I think the, the biggest, biggest change will come through the generational shift. Like when I look at my friend's kids play games, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a no-brainer. 
you know, that they see value in digital assets more than they see in physical assets. So once they start getting purchasing power, uh, that's when it's going to start becoming big. But it's not for everybody. You know, it's, it's not for the people who don't care about their online existence. And I think probably everybody over here has, you know, some type of affinity with games, with, you know, social media, with virtual reality, XR, AR, VR, metaverse, you know, all, all the buzzwords that exist, you know, we're all here for that reason and we're, we all are capable of seeing it. But this is a very niche community still in comparison to the rest of the world. So our question is, how are we going to make it accessible for the people who literally don't care about fashion, you know, like, I, and I re refer to myself, like, I used to be an introverted 3D nerd who literally just put on a, a black t-shirt and, you know, just some comfy pants, went behind my computer and just uh, punched some keys, so, you know, like, fashion is a, is a functionality, but digital fashion is at the moment not a functionality. So even though we're very focused on identity, now, where does the functionality of digital fashion come in? And it's going to have to be the whole ecosystem that creates those experiences where people are like literally waking up and they're like, oh shit, I have to put on digital clothing on my avatar today. Wow, I think what's really interesting about this notion of actually caring about digital relationships is because I think most of us in this room has developed a virtual relationship with somebody. Maybe it's a pen pal, a coworker, a colleague, a friend, and that relationship feels no less real just because it's digital. So when we start to talk about identity, just because it's virtual doesn't mean it is far removed from who we actually are in real life. Some people say like, I don't want to wear virtual clothes, I want to wear physical clothes. I don't think digital fashion aims to replace physical clothes, but it is changing our relationship to what does it mean to self-express. When it comes to NFTs, I think, uh, and how they enable essentially the sale of fashion and digital fashion, sometimes it feels like people are selling magic beans. They're like, ah, oh, this is going to change fashion from the ground up. So th there is, like you mentioned, Carrie, that utility is so, so important when it comes to the application of the garment. And yes, uh, we're not designing this for people that don't believe in this. I personally appreciate the critics because they usually bring up important questions around what's not working. I, I really love to listen to somebody who says, really cool what you're working on, but I really don't like X, Y, Z, because then it turns into a conversation. And if there's a critic here, please find me after. I'm curious to talk to you. Um, but Emma, I think when it comes to brands and the current landscape of how fashion functions, there is luxury labels, there's fast fashion labels, like that entire ecosystem, I don't think is thinking of appending itself to then just embrace digital fashion. So what's it going to take for fashion to really start to change? Um, and I think with you, you're starting with infrastructure. So how, what, what role does actually building infrastructure for digital fashion to become accessible play in this? Yeah, so um, to address as well your, your question on brands and looking at what is the current landscape of fashion and how do we actually um, get it to be authentically native to Web3? Well, first of all, we have to look at um, Web2 itself and how I kind of like to describe, okay, what is the difference between Web 1, Web 2, Web 3? Um, Star Wars. So, Web 1, A New Hope. Web 2, Empire Strikes Back. Web 2 is when all of that new hope that we had, um, the Empire, and they come and say, nope, sorry guys, like you thought that you could take it from us, but we're going to regain control. And then Web 3, Return of the Jedi. Web 3 is when Luke Skywalker um, slays the old decrepit empire, throws him down the shaft, and we take back what was rightfully ours. And then 789, that's just a bad nightmare. I mean, we can all ignore that. Um, but in, when you look at that, okay, what is the strategy of the empire? What has been the strategy of the empire for the past 70 years? What have we all been grown up um, being like, told, taught? How do we operate? How do we execute? It's really, really simple. Buy, copy, kill. Buy, copy, kill. That is the strategy in Web 2. And there's all different scales of it. Zuckerberg is really fucking good at buy, copy, kill. That's literally Facebook strategy. And then you have every kind of nuance in between that. Um, and so when you understand that, and now you look at Web 3, you realize that Web 3 is a complete rejection of buy, copy, kill. And how do you actually go and you implement that? Well, you've got to do three really important things. First of all, you have to decentralize the tech. So this is why um, blockchain technology, NFTs, ERC-20 tokens, they're really powerful. Then you have to decentralize the governance, so distribute the power, create checks and balances. And then number three, which is probably the most critical, you have to decentralize the capital stack. 
if you don't take the money um, out of the old static structures, if you don't um, circulate the money flow, which is really what capitalism at its root is all about, the generation and the circulation of wealth. And America right now is not capitalist. We are a debt-based society. It's just issuing debt and IOUs. Um, but you've got to do those three things. And anyone who says to you that they are in Web3 and they are not actively working across those three areas, decentralizing the tech, the governance, and the capital, then they are lying to you, and they're also probably lying to yourself. Uh, to themselves, sorry. Um, so they're really important. And so when we think about bigger brands coming into the space, um, I usually have two reactions when people tell me, you know, there's this brand XYZ and that they're coming into Web3 or they're, they're doing like an NFT fashion launch. Number one, I'm like, amazing, great, because that means exposure, that means activity, that means expanding the market, productive capacity, vitality, all the really important things that you need for momentum and engagement. And then the second thing that I, I think about is where does the money come from? This is a really important question. Where does the money come from? What VC are you in debt to? Which loan shark is propping you up? Um, what theatrical play are you trying to attempt to make at Web3 um, by putting it in a Web2 box or using Web2 tooling, using Web2 capital tooling to try and enable this new market to grow? Um, and good luck to them, but we all know how that ends, and it ends pretty badly. So um, in order to really take the industry into to Web3, to enable any, every designer, independent designer, to launch their own market, to go out there, to create capital, to create wealth, um, it means you have to rely on the strengths of Web3. Because as I said before, the entire medium that we're existing under is rapidly transforming. Um, it's like nothing that we've ever seen before. And just like all paradigm shifts, it's really hard to see when it's right in front of your eyes. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's that thing. Brands can come in and they can mint fashion NFTs. They can say that we're creating a blockchain marketplace, but that is not Web3. Web3 is actually being a Y Combinator of Web3 itself. It means advancing Web3 principles. It means being self perpetuating on what Web3 is. And this is why um, allowing designers to be able to come into the market, reduce friction, reduce barriers, sell an NFT that is this value conduit, where now they can gain capital directly, they're not in liability to a loan shark, to a VC, um, and they can operate in this, this open market where they can now breathe. We no longer need the Web2 behemoths um, suffocating the choke points. So everyone has to rely on them for, for our health, our wealth, and our growth. Um, and that's what's so powerful about that. We don't need that system anymore. When we were standing back, yeah. let's clap. <laughs> when we were standing backstage, I said, Emma, I have a theory that you drink Tabasco sauce for breakfast. <laughs> because the fire that she speaks with, I think, is incredibly inspiring and moving. And I think for all of us, as we're sitting here, she's describing a very important transformation where our power structures are moving from a hierarchy to a networked worldview, which means you, as a consumer, as a designer, as a person that wants to get involved in this space, you play a very active role in making this possible. So as these tools are being built out, they're meant to be used for these specific purposes. So I think brands are also having a knee-jerk reaction where they're saying, all right, the ground is really moving from under our feet. How are we going to play this out? And there is a lot of still ideas that digital fashion can be a really great marketing play. And it can, but that is not its crux of why digital fashion is even rising. So, Carrie, when you're looking at the vision of like how you, you wish digital fashion to take root within the fashion ecosystem, because we know what's not working, but it would be really nice to talk about what we want this place to look like. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, uh, to come back to the point that we definitely don't have to look at the fashion industry how it is right now and just replicate that. We we have to redefine what that means. And it's just like what Digital Axe is doing, what Artifact is doing, what all the digital fashion players are doing. They're basically doing it in, in a new way, you know, really just coming from this perspective of having zero understanding of how the fashion industry works and trying to redefine that. If you really look at, let's say, the supply chain issues that the fashion industry has, it's, it's massive. Like, you, you cannot scale that business model. And the business model is so focused on selling more physical clothing. But the business model in the digital fashion world, it changes because it's not about creating more. It's not about 
covering your body, keeping yourself warm. You know, it, it's about so many different aspects. So we have to recontextualize and think about what does digital fashion mean in the future? How is it going to impact our lives? And then be creative with that. I always say, what everything that we're doing is is, is a connection between creativity, technology, and business models. We're extremely good at the, the creative side of designing clothing. We're extremely good at creating tech and pipelines from the visual effects industry to optimize this clothing to multiple different environments. But the, the biggest creative challenge for the digital-only fashion industry is what is the business model that you tie into it? How are you going to be able to scale as a company? Because what I saw from selling our first digital-only dress on the blockchain, nobody took us seriously un until we started making real money with it. Now if, now, if companies are making millions and millions because of digital-only clothing, people are going to start asking questions of what's happening over there. Um, so I think we're, we're in this turning point right now. Um, I think all the, all the front runners of digital fashion are at this conference other than Artifact. Uh, so yeah, it's a, for, for me, it's a historical moment, and I feel very proud to be in a panel with some uh, uh, inspiring innovators, and I, I still have to meet a few others as well. Uh, um, does that answer your question, or did I just yes, ramble? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the business model needs to support this vision, and in many ways, it means completely abandoning it. And I think that's a decision that somebody has to be prepared to make, to leave that behind completely. And if I had to think of what I would really want to see is digital fashion being connected more to culture, because I don't think fashion is really meant to be experienced through a wind, like through the go through wind shopping experience. You're not supposed to be in this giant room calling through different sizes, going into fitting rooms. I think fashion is very reflective of who we are, of our culture, of where we come from, of how we want to feel. It is very personal, and it very often is disconnected from the very thing that makes it mean something to us, which is our memories, our, our experiences that we've had uh, at a concert. And that's part of the reason why we even buy merch, because you would have a moment listening to somebody you really love, having a great memory, and then buying a t-shirt that's cheaply made somewhere that's going to fade out and that really just going to you know, deteriorate in value other than the fact that it will still mean something sentimental to you. And I think NFTs uh, can give us a level of customization for fashion and fabrics and a virtual space that can just unleash that very aspect that we enjoy so much about merch. So my focus has been on uh, building that bridge between cultural experiences as well as how fashion can reflect those specifically for you and your digital wardrobe. And now on to you, Emma. Please um, share your vision of how you would like like fashion to be transformed by, uh, by this technology. Yeah, um, so I always like to distinguish between like just digital fashion and then also Web3 fashion, because there, there is actually a really important um, distinguish distinguishment sorry, to be made. And um, OK, visually, they might look the same. So say if we're both wearing like a digital dress from the outside, no one would really know. Um, but why would I want Web3 fashion over just digital fashion? And there's a few kind of best ways that I can answer that. Number one, it's by first understanding what actually is the metaverse, because um, most people have no idea what the metaverse is. And it's why all the references to the metaverse, it's either these like cartoon images, um, or people like see like, okay, there's like gonna be 3D objects on a screen, and maybe that screen's attached to my face, but I, I don't really understand it. Um, the metaverse is the removal of limitations on the ability for everyone that is interconnected through it, either um, by themselves or in groups, to be able to engage in the full range of power tools across governance, across finance, across fashion, food production, cultural, social experiences, literally everything. All of these tools that were previously only available to the very elite and top few, um, now through Web3, through decentralization, they get um, scattered and broadened edge to edge, so now we can all engage with it. And this is something so powerful because um, it allows us to build cities, it allows us to build nations, global economies. And when you think about civilization, a lot of us kind of are quite distant to it in the sense that we either think, okay, it's something that our ancestors created a really long time ago, um, it's something that is terribly managed and maintained by governance, and um, it's something that maybe we're like, lucky or unlucky enough to be a part of. But imagine if the mechanisms of what makes societies work had been um, refined, 
miniaturized, and then opened up enough so we could literally trade them at a personal level. Like, just actually think about that for a second. Um, oh, wrap it up? Okay, <laughs> I'll be really quick. Um, that is like a gold rush in itself. And so why Web3 fashion? Because now instead of just wearing a digital garment, I can now literally have the power tools and the super powers to um, launch entire cities, nations, economies through my programmable dress that maybe also unlocks something else or it is also governance within a DAO and it gives me access and rights and provenance um, throughout these entire realms. But yes, I will close it there. Oh. Thank you so much. <laughs> Please connect with us afterwards if you would like. And on to the next.